Hello, uh, my name is uh, David Villar, a professor of uh, pharmacology at the Colombian uh, Veterinary School. So, uh, welcome to this uh, video in which we are going to re review some basic uh, guidelines uh, for uh, urinary tract disease in dogs and cats. I just uh, wanted to remind you that uh, in 2015, AVMA uh, put together a task force on antimicrobial stewardship in companion animal practice, uh, basically to provide some guidance in light of the emerging impact of uh, multi-drug resistant organisms. And as you can see, they developed some uh, do's and don'ts on antimicrobial uh, prescribing. Uh, and for the case of uh, urinary tract disease, they recommend uh, to avoid diagnosing infection based on a free catch of uh, urine samples and to always uh, confirm an infection with uh, quantitative uh, cultures, as we will uh, see later. So if in the previous uh, video we said that uh, superficial skin infections accounted for the largest uh, reason for the overuse of antimicrobials, uh, with uh, urinary tract infections, uh, we could say it's another reason where uh, we certainly misuse and we uh, definitely overuse uh, antimicrobials because there have been no uh, clear uh, guidelines uh, for diagnosing and treatment, and treatment of many of uh, these uh, conditions. There have been a couple of uh, documents that were put together by the working group of the International Society for Companion Animal and Infectious Diseases. Uh, one uh, was uh, launched in 2011, and the second one came out on, on uh, 2019. And there has been a lot of uh, changes in between, and we're gonna try to point those out on this uh, presentation. As with everything in medicine, they base a recommendation on a diagnosis and they uh, divide the infections into four major uh, groups. A quick summary table uh, that can obviously not be applied to all the, all the time for all the conditions as we would uh, commit many pitfalls is the one uh, listed here. Uh, you do not want to treat empirically these days, even if it is the first time. As you can see, a uh, subclinical uh, bacteriuria does not require a treatment so that's one of the conditions that we may have uh, overuse uh, antimicrobials. Uh, just like in situations like when we uh, catheterize an animal uh, in which uh, we are uh, prompting them to develop uh, resistant bacteria if we need to treat them later on. So here are the four major groups that we're going to see one by one. And we're going to describe what the working group uh, suggests in each one of those uh, categories. Uh, the first one is the typical sporadic bacterial infection of the bladder in an otherwise uh, healthy animal, which is not secondary to another disease or uh, comorbidity. Uh, you reach a diagnosis by doing a complete urinalysis. Uh, that should be the minimum database for evaluation of any suspected uh, urinary tract infection. Ideally, you want to collect a sample by cystosynthesis, but if you have the animal uh, catheterized, obviously there is no need for doing that. Uh, free catch is definitely not a good idea uh, because they can be easily contaminated and provide a false positive with many counts which are not reliable. Uh, susceptibility is, is, is important and should always be done according to a set accepted standards so they can be easily interpreted and those uh, breakpoints established uh, for which specific drugs can be used. Uh, if you grow more than a thousand colonies per mil of urine, uh, that infection usually becomes relevant only if, but only if uh, clinical signs uh, uh, come along with it, uh, which is an indication that there is inflammation. Otherwise, uh, we're going to usually call it a subclinical infection, as we will see later, uh, which uh, does not warrant to be treated. Uh, those uh, clinical signs, as, as you see here, are uh, dysuria, polycuria. Uh, painful urination, uh, maybe some blood in the urine, urgency to urinate, uh, vocal, vocalization. So you basically need the, both the clinical signs and the positive uh, cultures to make a diagnosis of a urinary uh, tract infection which uh, deserves treatment. Uh, and uh, as, as you can see here, uh, one of the empirical treatments, uh, uh, which is usually a first-line choice, uh, is uh, amoxicillin clavulanic acid or a trimethoprim sulfur drug. And obviously, if you have a sensitivity test, you can reevaluate whether that empirical treatment continues uh, to be a trip, uh, appropriate or not. Now, the new edition of the 2019 guidelines, 
is that instead of uh, 7 to 14 days, now they suggest a shorter course of 3 to 5 days. And, and there are two studies in which uh, the outcomes uh, were uh, clinical and microbiological cure rates. And it was found that the shorter term is uh, just as good as the long-term therapy, uh, which, uh, as I say, has been the traditional therapy. Ideally, the aim now is to decrease the bacteria load to a level that allows the clinical signs of the infection to be controlled, uh, while at the same time the immune system is eradicating the remaining bacterial organisms uh, from the tissues. Obviously, in this case, is the bladder and the urethra. And as you can see here, the first one uh, was, give, uh, was given a trimethropine a sulfamethoxazole at, at 15 milligrams per kilogram orally twice a day for three days. And they were comparing that with uh, cephalexine uh, for 10 days. And uh, the second one uh, was uh, given enrofloxacin uh, for uh, 24 hours uh, for three days. And that was uh, uh, being compared with amoxicillin clavulanic acid uh, twice a day for 14 days. And they say that uh, both protocols were just as effective clinically and microbiologically. So I guess the latest on this issue is that the short-term duration is just as good as the longer one. Now, uh, a complicated uh, urinary tract infection is the presence of, uh, uh, of the urinary infection uh, with an anatomic or functional or a comorbidity which is uh, predisposing the patient to have uh, that persistent infection or a recurring infection, or a treatment failure, or what have you. So as you can imagine, identifying and managing that uh, relevant risk factor is going to be critical for the long-term success uh, of the infection. We need to find that underlying problem and solve it, or otherwise it's going to undermine whatever treatment you apply. The other thing is that we need that if we treat this dog previously with an antimicrobial, we probably want to switch to a different one. Uh, for example, if you have uh, given amoxicillin, you probably want to switch to a trimethropine sulfur drug. And the other thing is that uh, that has changed is that they no longer recommend treatment for four weeks. And just as I mentioned earlier, now it should be reassessed based probably on culture results. If it is a recurrent cystitis, in other words, a reinfection after a successful treatment, they suggest a shorter course of three to five days duration. And, what it is, and when it's a relapse, which is a failure to have eliminated the previous uh, pathogen, and they tend to, uh, usually they tend to occur within weeks as opposed to months for the reinfections, uh, then they suggest a longer course of seven to four days uh, therapy. The one, the one thing that is uh, crucial for being successful is obviously controlling the underlying cause, uh, whether it's a poorly managed diabetes, an allergy with uh, corticosteroids, uh, hyperthyroidism, or whatever uh, endocrinopathy or other comorbidity you may have. And finally, once we achieve uh, clinical and microbiological cure, what is uh, usually uh, considered successful uh, five to seven days after cessation of uh, the antimicrobial therapy, th there is always a very high chance of uh, recurrence. And in humans, they have found that uh, cranberry juice is uh, usually pretty good to prevent those uh, recurrences. But at the moment, uh, there are really no good studies in dogs to say what can be done to prevent it. Now, the other category is uh, subclinical bacteria. And as its name indicates, is the presence of bacteria in the urine determined by a positive uh, bacterial culture. That's not when we say it by cytology, and that's in the absence of uh, clinical science. In other words, in an asymptomatic animal. Other findings of the analysis, even when we find uh, white blood cells, that may be predictive, but it doesn't, uh, that there might be an infection, but it does not indicate that uh, it's necessary <coughs> grounds uh, for treatment. And the reason being is that there are many healthy dogs uh, that may have a subclinical bacteria. And as you can see, the rates uh, vary between 2 to 12 percent, depending on the study. And those values may go up uh, with uh, diabetes, obesity, animals that are given glucosteroids. And, there is, uh, and the reason is that there is really no clear association between subclinical bacteria and the risk of developing cystitis.
And in humans, they received a systematic review which concluded that uh, while you may eliminate bacteria in the urine by treating uh, with uh, antimicrobials in the short term, that effect is usually not sustained and there is always going to be a recolonization when you suspend the treatment. And if those individuals uh, have a feature urinary tract infections, uh, they will have a higher rate of uh, resistant bacteria. And there is also anecdotal evidence that even if you have multidrug resistant bacteria, it will probably not affect whether you treat or not. And in fact, if you withhold the treatment, they will sometimes be replaced by susceptible organisms. And if those animals subsequently develop a cystitis, then the drugs will work. So there is really no grounds uh, for treating with uh, antimicrobials. Now, the other common situation that results in bacteria in the urine is uh, catheterization of the urethra. And as you can see, between 10 and 50 percent, depending on the study you look at, and here the important thing is to know whether there is a real cystitis that which requires a treatment or a subclinical bacteria which should not be treated. In other words, uh, whether you have the picture on the right or the picture on the left. And as you can see here, the recommendation is that prophylactic antimicrobial treatment in the absence of clinical evidence of cystitis or uh, pyelonephritis should not be given. So the last condition and the, and the worst one for, for which we obviously want to start using antimicrobials uh, right away is uh, pyelonephritis, which as its name indicates is the, an infection of the renal parenchyma itself, uh, usually an ascending infection. Also, it could be uh, it could also all, always come from a bacteremia also. So as you can imagine, this is a very serious condition compared to a cystitis, and it may cause a very rapid kidney injury and a sepsis which can kill the animal. And obviously, a quick diagnosis is very important, and so is the treatment. The diagnosis uh, can be very challenging. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you can suspect it based on a positive uh, bacterial culture and very severe systemic signs on the animals, uh, which uh, require treatment immediately and before you even uh, wait for uh, cultures and susceptibility uh, tests, obviously. Here you have some of the uh, empirical uh, treatment choices, uh, fluoroquinolones, uh, some, uh, some of the cephalosporins. Uh, they do not recommend that the duration of treatment be as long as it used to be, Instead of four to six weeks, uh, now they suggest 10 to 14 days, like they do in human. With everything we just said, let's uh, wrap up with the study. They look at, uh, historically, a population of dogs uh, with the three main categories of urinary tract infections, and they wanted to determine how uh, the use of antimicrobials was associated with uh, antimicrobial resistance. So as you can see, they had a population of 1,028 cases of uh, urinary tract uh, infection, and they were classified as uncomplicated, complicated, or pyelonephritis. So as you can see, they provided a table for dogs with complicated urinary tract infections, and they had the comorbidities identified at the time of diagnosis, uh, most of those uh, dogs were being referred from a primary care uh, veterinarian as uh, recurring uh, infections. And they were also uh, dogs that were undergoing treatment for many of the conditions reported here. As you can see, most of them were uh, immunosuppression uh, diseases, probably uh, were given uh, glucosteroids or some other uh, type of uh, immunosuppressive uh, uh, drugs. Second ones were uh, kidney disease, either uh, chronic or acute, and they were followed with some uh, endocrinopathies, hyperadrenocorticism, uh, diabetes, and so on. So if we look at the results, the one thing important was that dogs with complicated urinary tract infection in general had more isolates that were resistant to a wide range of antimicrobials than the uncomplicated ones. But not by a great margin, though. Maybe just uh, between 2 one, uh, two per percent for amikacin, all the way up to 13.4 for enrofloxacin. And uh, another important finding, which is not shown here, is that the proportion of isolates that were multidrug resistant was very high, about 31%. And of those, uh, 79 were staphylococcus, and 30% were uh, enter enteric species.
And again, the proportion of multidrug isolates from dogs with complicated was higher, 36% compared with those isolates that were from uncomplicated infection. The other important results of this study was that uh, dogs that receive amoxicillin, doxycycline, or enrofloxacin 30 days before the urine was obtained for doing bacterial cultures had higher resistance levels. So as you can see, we're comparing column A, there are the percent of isolates that were susceptible uh, to the designated antimicrobials for dogs being administered that antimicrobials within 30 days uh, before cultures. They're comparing those dogs to those that do, do, did not receive antimicrobials within 30 days before culturing. So the values are strikingly different, 40 to 60 for amoxicillin, 40 to 72 for doxycycline, and 28 to 77 for enrofloxacin. So let's uh, put it all together. The conclusions from this study that we can apply to our routine practice are that uh, we have, if we had previously given any antimicrobial, at least 30 days of collecting the urine sample for doing a bacterial culture, the chances are that whatever isolates we get are likely to be more resistant, not only to that type of antimicrobials, but probably to other ones also. What I found most relevant in this study is that none of the bacterial isolates achieve a susceptibility rate of more than 90% to any antimicrobials. In other words, out of 100 isolates, there are always going to be 10 that would always be resistant to whatever antimicrobial you decide to choose as a treatment option, even if you have never uh, treated that dog previously with anything. So as you can imagine, the fact that any one antimicrobial, no one antimicrobial will kill all the pathogens in the population combined with the a great percent of multidrug resistant organisms, 21% in the uncomplicated dogs. That's probably more than enough grounds, uh, beyond any reasonable doubt, as any lawyer would say, to do a sensitivity test uh, in any dog, even if it is, if it is the first time that you're going to treat it. And finally, I think that we could, we could definitely say that if you have al already prescribed an animal with any antimicrobial, that's going to affect your empirical choices, obviously. And, that, and that's when doing a, a sensitivity test becomes even more important. Although, as I just mentioned, with such a large percentage of resistant bacteria that, no, the, that we have nowadays, it probably just pays off to, do, to be on the safe side and start doing sensitivities from the very beginning. So I hope all this information was uh, worth uh, listening. I hope you learned something and I look forward to having you in future uh, presentations. So until next time, bye-bye for now.